Up to this point, we've talked about the ideal gas law, that is PV equals NKT, and we simply presented this law as being a fact, and this law was first discovered through experiment. A variety of different experimenters found that the pressure and the temperature of a gas were linearly related, the volume and the temperature were linearly related, the pressure and volume were inversely related, and they came up with this gas law. That's thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is studying a system, studying its macroscopic properties empirically and coming up with laws like this. What I like to do now is approach the ideal gas from a statistical mechanics point of view. That is, we're going to look at the ideal gas microscopically. We're going to look at the motion of all the particles. We're going to average that motion together in a certain way. And from that, we're actually going to derive the ideal gas law. So to do this, the ideal gas is made up of, a, of n independent particles. They're all moving around randomly. Um, not randomly. They're all moving around. They're, ju they're just particles shooting around, bouncing off of things and so forth. And they don't interact with each other. So what I want to do is first is just start with a single particle in the ideal gas law. So this is the picture that we have in mind. Let's suppose we have a container. where the gas is contained, okay? This container has length L. And on one side of the container is a piston, okay? And this piston, it, the piston is probably, it's not going to move, okay? We can think of it as a pressure detector if we like, okay? And this has cross-sectional area A. Okay? And so the volume of the box is simply A times L. Inside this box, we're going to have a single particle. Okay? This particle is moving with some velocity at a moment in time. There it is. Okay? And that velocity has an X component to it. All right? And we'll draw that X component of the velocity in as well. We'll call that V sub X. X being horizontal in this case. Right? And we're assuming that this particle is moving according to Newton's law, so that it's going to keep moving in a straight line forever until it runs into something. And the only thing it's going to run into are the walls of this container. Right? We're going to assume that the walls, that the, the particle collides with the walls elastically. Okay. That is, um, no energy is lost when the particle collides with this wall. And if we ignore gravity, which we're going to do, that means that the kinetic energy of this particle, 1 half mv squared, is a constant. And assuming that the mass of the particle is not changing, that means that the magnitude of the velocity, the speed of the particle, is constant all the time. The speed of this particle never changes as it's moving around. Okay. This, this assumption that particle, the particle collides elastically is actually a really good one for microscopic particles. In the macroscopic world, particles are always losing energy when they collide with things. Inelastic collisions are normal. In the microscopic world, elastic collisions are much more normal. Um, so this is not an outrageous assumption. The other thing we're going to assume, uh, that momentum is concerned, and uh, we're also going to, well that's a natural assumption, we're going to assume that the walls are perfectly smooth, so that the collisions are like reflections. What do I mean by that? Well, if we have a wall that is the bottom wall, and the particle comes in, and hits the wall like that, okay, then the ball is going to bounce up. What's going to happen when it collides with that wall is that the y component of the velocity will change. The y comp component of the velocity will reverse, but the x component of the velocity will stay the same. Okay, And that's because the wall is only exerting a normal force on the ball, and the normal force points up. 
So that means that the horizontal acceleration of the ball is zero during the collision. And so that means that the, the horizontal velocity of the ball doesn't change. Okay, so this ball has velocity vx. After the collision, it also has velocity vx. If we have a vertical wall like this and the particle comes in, the vertical velocity stays the same. The horizontal velocity changes, of course, but all the horizontal velocity does is it flips sign. So if this is negative vx, let's say, then this is going to be vx afterwards. And so what that means, if we look at both of these pictures, is that not only is the speed of the particle constant, but the x component, the magnitude of the x component of the velocity is also going to be constant. That is, as this particle collides around inside the box, these two quantities, the speed and vx, the magnitude of vx, they're never going to change, ever, right? given these two assumptions. And these are key to our derivation. Now, what I'd like to do, in order to define the ideal gas law, I need to define the pressure. I need to somehow go from a single particle running into walls and the pressure. Okay, So what does that mean? What does pressure mean? Well, pressure is defined, and let, let's say we want to calculate the pressure specifically on this right wall. We could do it on any of the walls. I just picked the right wall. Uh, to be specific. Well, the pressure on this wall is equal to the force on the wall divided by the area. But the force on the wall, if you look at it, most of the time the force on the wall is zero. Nothing is touching it. Right? But every once in a while, the particle smacks into the wall, and when it smacks into the wall, it exerts a force on it. Well, if we think macroscopically, what we're going to have is we're going to have the ideal gas, we're going to have these part all these individual particles smacking into the walls continuously. Um, and so these forces are going to add up. So what we're going to do now is we're going to define the pressure not as the force per area. We won't think of the pressure as being an ins instantaneously changing. Instead, we'll define the pressure as an average over time. So we'll take the average force on the wall. Okay? And because the pressure has to be outward, uh, we'll define this as the average x component of the force on the wall divided by the area of the wall. Okay. Well, the average force on the wall, according to Newton's second law, is equal to the mass. Um, oh, okay, I have to be careful here. So f of x is the average force on the wall, okay? But this is also equal to the average force on the particle. Because the only thing that ever collides with the wall is the particle. And Newton's third law says if the particle exerts a force on the wall, the wall exerts a force on the particle. So this average, if we ignore the minus sign, uh, which we will, this average is also the average force on the particle. And then the average force on the particle, according to Newton's second law, is equal to the mass of the particle times its average acceleration, horizontal acceleration, which is its mass times the average change in velocity of its horizontal velocity divided by the change in time. All right, now this is an average with respect to time, and so we say, well, what time span are we going to average over? Obviously, if we pick a very short time span where the particle is in the middle of the box, then this could be very different. So we need to average over a large enough time span so that the particle has got, had enough time to completely go um, wherever it's going to go. Okay? Um, this particle is basically going to, it's going to hit the front of the box and the right side of the box and the left side of the box and the right side of the box. Less, uh, it's going to keep going back and forth, back and forth forever. Uh, so what we're going to do is... Oh, it's going to keep going back and forth forever. And if you look at it, we, def we said before that the length of the box is L. And we said, so we said that Vx, the magnitude of the horizontal velocity, is constant. All right. So you've got, when the particle starts over here and is moving in this direction, and we ask, how long to reach the right-hand wall. 
Well, this is a kinematics problem, and the time it takes for it to reach the right-hand wall is simply the time it takes for it to move horizontally across a distance L. And so we can ignore completely the, um, uh, the y component of the velocity and the time it takes for it to cross the box from left to right is equal to the length it has to travel, L, divided by the horizontal component of the velocity, Vx. And remember, Vx is constant. It's not changing. It's the same forever. So that means that this particle always takes time L over Vx to go from left to right. Every time. And if we look at the, the, the other case where the particle is going backwards, okay, um, the x component of its velocity is also vx going back. It's just negative. It's just pointing in the opposite direction. And so that means that the time it takes for the ball to go from right to left is also L over vx. And so this particle is going to take this time L over Vx to go from left to right, and then the same time to go back to left, and the same time to go left to right, and so forth. It's going to keep doing the same thing over and over again. So let's, let's calculate our time average over the time span where the particle starts at the left, goes to the right, and then returns to the left. Okay. And an important thing that I'm going to say here is that the collision with the right wall is included. but the collision with the left is not. That is, we're going to start our average right after the ball leaves the left-hand wall. We'll have it bounce off the right-hand wall. We'll come back and we'll stop our stopwatch, stop our average right before it collides again. All right. So we said the average force on the ball is equal to m times the average of the change in velocity during this time divided by delta t. If we look at the box, the beginning, at the beginning the particle is over here and it's moving to the right and has velocity vx. Right? At the end, the particle is over here and has velocity negative vx, and I'll keep the minus sign. So that means that delta vx, the change in the velocity, is equal to minus vx, that's the final, minus vx. This is the final velocity, this is the initial velocity. Okay, that means that's going to be equal to negative 2 vx. And delta t, the time it takes for the ball to go from left to right and back to left is twice the time we found before, 2 L over Vx. So that means that the average force is equal to m times 2 Vx. I'm going to get rid of the minus sign here, because that just tells me direction, not important, divided by 2 L over Vx. All right, if we put those together, we see that the 2s cancel. The Vx's do not cancel because the Vx in the denominator comes up and multiplies the top, and we get m Vx squared over L. If we combine that with this formula, the formula for the pressure, the pressure on that right-hand wall is equal to the average force, of the, average force on the particle divided by the area of the piston of the wall. That means that the pressure 
is equal to m vx squared over LA. And LA, we said at the beginning, is simply the volume. So that means that the pressure on this wall is equal to m times the velocity, uh, the x the component of the velocity squared divided by the volume. And I'll write, put little serifs on the V for volume to distinguish it from velocity. Now this is the pressure for a single molecule. If we have n molecules, each independent of the others, then the total force on that piston is equal to the average force from the first particle plus the average force from the second particle, etc. Okay, and we found before that the average force on each particle is equal to m times the velocity of the first particle squared over l. Uh, m and l are the same, but the velocities, the speeds, the velocities could be different. Plus m v two x squared over l plus etc. And we'll assume that m is the same. The, all the particles have the same mass. And therefore, the pressure on this box is equal to the total force divided by the area. And so that means that that's going to be equal to m over LA times V1x squared plus V2x squared plus V3x squared, et cetera, all the way up to Vnx squared. Okay. Now this sum, if we took this sum and we divided it by n, that would be equal to the average horizontal velocity squared of the particles. If we took that sum and divided by n, that would be an average. Therefore, if we take the average and multiply it by n, that's equal to that sum. Okay? So that means that we can write the pressure is equal to m over, this is volume, m over v times n times the average of vx squared. Or another, we, we can rearrange this a little bit. We'll pull the v over to the left-hand side. pv is equal to n and we can move the mass into the average because the mass is a constant. So the pressure times the volume is equal to the number of particles times the average of this quantity, mvx squared. Now mvx squared looks really interesting. That looks almost like um, the kinetic energy or the horizontal component, uh, the horizontal piece of the kinetic energy. And according to the equipartition theorem, this, one-half mvx squared, is one of the terms of the total energy of the system. It's one of the degree, uh, degrees of freedom terms. Uh, one of the quadratic degree of freedom terms. And according to the equipartition theorem, if this gas is in uh, thermal equilibrium, this is equal to one-half times k times t the temperature. Therefore, if we multiply both sides by 2, the average of mvx squared is equal to kt. We put that into the equation above, and we get that p, the pressure times the volume, is equal to n times the Boltzmann constant times the temperature of the gas, which is the ideal gas law, which is what we were trying to prove. Okay. It's good to go back and remember what assumptions did we make that this were true. We may assume that the ideal gas was made up of n independent particles that were moving around inside the box. They were colliding elastically with the sides of the particles. There was no energy lost to friction due to in the collisions, and that the walls were smooth. Now, we, we solved this for a rectangular box. We could go about and prove that this is true for any shaped box. We're not going to do it. Well, uh, that's, the hand, that's where I'm going to hand wave and say it works anyway. So those are pretty simple conditions. And from those conditions, we derive the ideal gas law, which took, I don't know, 100, 200 years for people to derive um, or to deduce from experiments using a simple statistical mechanics argument, we can prove, hey, this is what it has to be. 
making these simple assumptions and we see it matches with the experiment, that means that our model, this ideal gas model, may be very useful to us. While we're thinking about statistical mechanics of an ideal gas, we might be interested in knowing what are some of the properties of this gas. In particular, we talked about the speed of this particle as it moved around, and we might wonder, well, what is the average speed of this particle? Well, we can get close to knowing the correct answer to that by looking at uh, using the echopartition theorem. So the speed of the particle, well, first of all, the, velo the speed of the particle is the magnitude of the velocity. Now, if I take the magnitude of the velocity squared, that is the speed squared, we find that by writing the x component of the velocity squared plus the y component squared plus the z component squared. All right, and so if I want to find the, um, so that's true. Now the equipartition theorem has something to say about the average kinetic energy of the particles. So I'll write, I'll multiply um, both sides by one half m, and then I'll take a time average. Okay, and I can take the time average of each term over here separately because the sum of averages is equal to the average of the sums. Right? 1 half mv squared is equal to the average of 1 half mvx squared plus 1 half mvy squared plus 1 half mvz squared. Now according to the, each of these terms on the right hand side are degrees of freedom terms. And so according to the equipartition theorem, each one is equal to 1 half kt. 1 half kt, 1 half kt, plus, plus, plus. And so that means that the average of 1 half mv squared is equal to 3 halves. Kt, and if I multiply both sides by 2, and if I divide, move the m over to the other side, I get that the average of the velocity squared, the average of the c speed squared of this particle in this ideal gas, is equal to 3 kt over m. Right. Now the thing, now this thing, 3 kt over m, has units of speed squared. If I want to write it just in terms of speed, I can take the square root of both sides, and I get the square root of v squared is equal to the square root of 3 kt over m. Okay. This quantity here is called the root mean square speed, or the RMS speed of the particle. And it's simply what the name says. We take the root of the mean of the square of the speed. That's equal to the square root of 3 kT over m. Now you may be tempted to say, oh, I've got the square root of a square term, and therefore this root mean square speed is just simply equal to v. But that's not true. In general, the square root of the average of a square is not equal to the average of v itself. We can look at a very simple example to see that. So this is true. Let's suppose that v1 was equal to 3 and v2 was equal to 4 uh, meters per second, let's say. And we wanted to take the average of those two speeds. The average speed of this is 3 plus 4 over 2. It's 3.5 meters per second. But the average of the squares would be, well, I have to square both terms, 3 squared plus 4 squared, and then divide that by 2. Well, 3 squared plus 4 squared is 25 divided by 2. And then if I take the square root of that, that's equal to the square root of 25 over 2. That's equal to 5 over the square root of 2. And that's equal to 3.54 meters per second. Now notice they are kind of close to each other. Okay, Close, but not exact. 
Okay? And it turns out that the, the, the larger the spread of velocities we have, I picked two that were pretty close to each other, three and four, the larger the spread of the velocities, the bigger the difference there's going to be. Another example we could take is v1 is equal to zero meters per second, and v2 is equal to uh, 10 meters per second. Okay? The average velocity is 5 meters per second. The average square velocity is equal to 0 squared plus 10 squared divided by 2. That's equal to 50. Right? 0 plus 100. The average between 0 and 100 is 50. And therefore, the square root of the average of v squared is equal to the square root of 50, which is close to 7. So now there's 2 meters per second difference.